Hello, I'm Jim Mullins, and I'm the Dean of Libraries at Purdue University. And I'm going to be talking to you a bit today about um, a new building that we just opened in August called the Wilma, uh, the Thomas S. and Harvey D. Wilma Active Learning Center. And um, we think it's something that is very unique um, in conceptualization of combining both the uh, classrooms and the library. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of that first. But first, I'm going to show you some videos. Each year, for about the last four years, Purdue has sponsored, Purdue Library sponsors a contest among our students about why do I love Purdue Libraries. And in the past, they do these wonderful videos, and we give out $1,000 as the first prize, $750 for second prize, and $500 for third prize, underwritten by one of our local banks. And this year we decided we would change it and it would be the Wilmoth Active Learning Center wall. They call it the wall. We weren't quite sure what they were going to call it. Um, we thought maybe Wilmoth or the Active Learning Center, but since in the, in the schedule of courses it's abbreviated WALC, they call it the wall. Um, so I'm going to show you the videos that we did. The videos I used in the past, in the years, to help get support for the libraries by showing it to the trustees, showing it to alumni, and showing it to donors. So I'm going to show you, well, go ahead. So these are four different Today, videos. college students face the challenge of trying to balance studying, sleep, and socializing. It's been said balancing all three is nearly impossible, but now with the Thomas S. and Harvey D. Wilmoth Active Learning Center, it's easy. Not only can you study, sleep, and socialize, but the 164,000 square foot facility houses the Library of Engineering and Science and 27 classrooms designed for active learning. Some of the quietest study spots can be found in the library. With individual booths and desk space, it's easy to get studying done. Another great study spot is the Mullins Reading Room. The room is kept quiet for individual study. However, if you have a group project and need to work with others, there are plenty of collaborative study areas. Walt also houses the Develop Data Visualization Experience Lab of Purdue. Students also have access to computers and printers whenever needed. The building houses many artifacts and pieces of history that can all be learned about on the Archives and Artifacts audio tour. The tour can be accessed online or through your phone. Site 17. The Wilmot Active Learning Center honors two brothers who earned their engineering degrees at Purdue University. The cafe, library, unique furniture, and study spaces are what make Walk such a great resource for students and faculty.
Purdue University is hard. Like, really hard. <laughs> and my favorite place to do that is the brand new. You have things like the Library of Engineering and Science, the Center for Instructional Excellence, so much cool artwork throughout the entire building. You have the best view on campus with so many cool study areas with more computers than you could ever need. Most importantly for college students, you have food. But I feel like the reason that most students go to Wall and the reason that I go to Wall is because I need to do one thing and one thing only to study. And there are so many cool places to study. Absolutely silent. It's incredible. One last one. We had 24 submissions. to show you those videos at the beginning so you could get an idea of the space. I've had various people visit who have seen or heard me talk about it, but until they see it, they can't quite conceptualize it. Because I have to tell people when they come into the building, wherever you see carpet, that's the library. Because it, the library is scattered throughout the entire building. And so the classrooms are adjacent to, to library spaces and they flow out into the library. And at, after 5.30, all of those classrooms become study spaces. So after, at, after 5.30, 164,000 square feet becomes a library, all supervised by the library. Okay. Now, I've credited Susie Hudson, who is Assistant Director of Planning, Facilities and Planning and Construction at University of Central Florida. She had been in Purdue, and so she went down to Florida and came back up and was taking pictures, and she sent me the slide presentation she did, and I said, Susie, these are wonderful slides, can I use them? And she gave me permission. And so I said, and I'll include you so you can be part of this presentation for this. She said, oh good, I'll add it to my CV. <laughs> okay. It consolidated six of our campus libraries, our science and engineering libraries. We had 16 libraries at Purdue, and the majority of them are science and engineering. And so we brought together our uh, science, engineering, chemistry, physics, earth and atmospheric sciences, pharmacy, and life sciences. And the gross square feet of the building is 178,000, um, assignable 93,000. The internal staircase um, takes quite a bit of the available square footage of the building, and I've had students complain about that. But unfortunately, to get people through the building, you do need stairs. Uh, the building budget itself was 79 million. 50 million came from the state of Indiana as a cash gift. Um, no bonding, it was a cash gift. 13 million from the university, 16 million from the libraries that we had to raise. I had to sign a contract with the president that I would have all of the money in hand before we started the building project. 
and we did it. Um, then the university put another 18 million into the surrounding area to finish off the uh, plaza. So the entire project was just under 100 million, no debt. The artifacts that you saw, that people talked about, were from this building. It was built on the site of the old 1924 power plant, which at the time it was built was on the north edge of campus. By the time this building was, uh, that we started with uh, um, our construction, the campus had extended all the way around us, so this power plant was now sitting in the middle of campus. In the 1960s, a new power plant was built on the south side of campus, and in the 1980s, this plant was decommissioned. The smokestack that you see was, as people have fondly called it, Purdue's finger to the world. Um, it was, if you saw the, the picture of the smokestack, or the bell tower, the smokestack was 60 feet taller than the bell tower. So it was highly visible, and so it was the landmark that people used. When they decided to tear it down in the early 90s, tear down the smokestack, people complained and said, but it's the icon for the university. A very wise president of the university said at the time, I don't remember ever seeing that on any of our stationery or any of our publicity. Instead, they built the, the bell tower. So when, this, when the decision was built, it decided that we would tear this building down. I said, and I, I'm a history buff, I said we have to preserve this building. This building had a very important role by providing heat and electricity for the entire university, which it could not, the university could not have survived without this. So the building was demolished, but we saved elements. We went into it and took the pieces from the building that we thought helped to tell the story. It also served as an active learning center because engineering students in mechanical and civil took classes in there. Faculty took them in and showed them actual operations. So even though we were building an active learning center, we said it's on the site of an active learning building. And we have large pictures that were taken of students and faculty and, and workers in the building blown up on the walls. You may have seen a couple of them in the slides. Okay, in the, in the videos you may have seen that you can see into the classrooms. A lot of the classrooms are all glass, so that you look into them. That was for two reasons. Active learning requires that student work, students work in teams. And it was to get away from the concept of having students working and listening to professor and not really um, having the chance to explore the ideas amongst themselves. So about five years ago, six years ago, we, Purdue launched a program called IMPACT, Instruction Matters Purdue Academic Course Transformation, because we were dissatisfied with the number of students who were moving from, matriculating from first to second year um, in some of our major courses. We were at an 88% matriculation rate. That was not acceptable to, University, to Purdue. We wanted to be closer to 93 to 95% matriculation. And the decision was made, it was the large lecture classes that was causing this disadvantage for our students. So the, the intent was to put the lectures online, and this was across campus in chemistry, political science, psychology, and then to have the students working in teams uh, so that they could help teach each other as well as listen to the professor who was there as a coach. The, the president of the university, Mitch Daniels, thinks this is a very, very good way to teach. So he gave us an instruction, do not want to walk into the new Wilmoth Active Learning Center and seeing a professor lecture to their class. He wants to see active learning. So he said, we need to have glass so people can see into it. It also helps for the second purpose, and that is for those rooms to be study rooms. So that activity can go on in those rooms, students can be studying, and we can see in so that they don't feel isolated. We opened um, the first day of classes in this fall. And I happened to not be there. I was in Poland, Italy. And people started sending me pictures immediately. And they said, Jim, it's full. It's full right away. Um, students were in there. It sits right in the middle of campus, as I said. And it's on a major thoroughfare. And so the students naturally gravitated towards it. The area that you see on the left side is right inside the front doors. 
And our assumption was that as people are walking past and they have an hour to spend, they'll come in, sit down, use, stay in the library for a period of time, and then leave. Or if they have a class in the building, they'll come down and use it. Um, we moved as many computers as we had in our six libraries into this building. So this building, even though the students talk about how many computers it has, it has no more than the six libraries had themselves. The seating is also similar. The building sit seats 4,000. The light well in the middle of the building. We hired a, um, Nancy Fried Foster, who is a, 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 a anthropologist. She led a team of, of people in the libraries to go out and talk to the students as we were planning the building and saying, what is it that you want to see in this building? What will you want to know? Will be, or what do you want to be sure is going to be in this building? They had several things that they said they want to see. They wanted to have natural light. They wanted to see out. They wanted to see books. And even though we all know that books are not the heaviest used item amongst our, in our libraries, they said we want to see books because that helps us know that we're in a library. When the building opened, we were curious about how the students would refer to this, whether they would see this as a library or not. And I've been standing outside sometimes when the students will be giving tours to prospective students, and they'll, they'll point to it and say, this is our newest library, the Wilmoth Active Learning Center. And we still have our, our Humanities Social Science Education Library, which is more or less seen as the central library. Um, we also have a business library, vet med library, math library, and aviation library. The reading room, and I will, for lack of humility, I did take off the Mullins in front of this. Um, Susie had Mullins on there. Um, two years ago, the president announced at my Dean's Advisory Council meeting that he was naming the reading room for me. I was honored and flabbergasted. And then I said, and don't tell anyone. Um, because this was, the building was just under construction. And this was two years before it was to be completed. And I said, this is totally inappropriate for this to be known, that a room like this was being named for an employee. So for two years, it was kept under wraps. Then it was announced at the dedication of the building. I'm very honored, and this is where my retirement reception will be this coming Friday. Um, the bridge, if you, I think there's a bit of you here. If, when you're looking at the reading room, the reading room has very traditional uh, finishes in it, more or less art, arts and crafts, Frank Lloyd Wright because there's also a very large reproduction of George Washington crossing the Delaware. That the president called me one day and said, that painting has to hang in that building. Do you have a place for it? And I thought, oh God. <laughs> this, building, this building was to be high tech, to be all industrial, to reflect the power plant. And I thought, how do we put George crossing the Delaware in this ultra tech building? So we then compromised and we said we're going to redo the reading room in this arts and crafts, Frank Lloyd Wright, because it was kind of a happy medium uh, between the two. And my wife thought it was very odd when she first saw it that there was this really very traditional look of the reading room. On the other side is this bridge that is made out of steel and concrete, um, more or less to help epitomize Purdue and the engineering func function of the university. <laughs> Um, that's kind of self-explanatory. The, the chair that uh, the young woman is sitting in, we picked those because it was evocative of the smokestack, that it was tall and slender. And, and I said, and we have to cover it in red so that it's the color of the brick. Well, those of you who are not from Indiana will realize someone at Purdue would not use red <laughs> because that's the IU color. And so I had to say it was a brick red. It's not, it's not a crimson. And, uh, and we had visitors from IU. I'm an IU grad. But we had visitors from IU come up, and I was pointing this out to them. And I said, well, this would be like at IU not using black. 
um, since our colors are black and gold. And they said, oh, but we never put black and gold together at IU. <laughs> so those kinds of strange little, uh, the other thing you'll notice is that the colors on the furniture are all very muted. I don't know if you've worked with interior designers, but they tend to really like uh, kind of flashy colors that are very trendy. That in five years, everybody's going to say screens, uh, mid-20-teens. Mid so we kept them very much in the grays and only a little bit of color at some time. The, the desk there are, is made out of bricks from the old power plant. And is the, the diameter is the same as the, the smokestack. And the grating behind, which looks like you're looking into a, a boiler, is actually from the old smoke stick, or from the old power plant. And we, I had not ever been in the power plant until about a year before it was torn down. And a group of us went in so that we could see it. And a group of us were standing way up on top of these grates that you could see down below us. This building, we were about six of us were standing up there when all of a sudden the whole thing kind of shifted. <laughs> and and I turned to this friend of mine. I got a picture of him. He's going, um, and I said, "Do you realize we're standing 65 feet above the floor in a building that has not been maintained in 30 years?" We got down real fast. <laughs> um, but it was the, this whole thing about trying to incorporate the building. And you'll see up above here. That's one of the murals that's on the walls, where you see a faculty member, a worker in the power plant and students who are learning from the experience of being in the power plant. Okay, these are the classrooms. And as we said, we have 27 classrooms. And um, the one performance room, the Heiler Theater, seats 329. I had to do a song and dance to the president to get him to accept that as being an active learning space because he saw it as a lecture hall. And was really concerned that it was not going to allow students to be able to collaborate. But along with the dance professor and people from Center of Structural Excellence, we said active learning takes place in many different ways. And it's not always just the people working in teams. Um, we also wanted it for lectures and things in the evening. Um, and it has no stage. It, it's flat. So that when you look down at it, it's, it, you feel like you're looking at a stage, but you're really not, in order to allow the person in the front of the room to easily move back and forth throughout the room. Uh, the Boiler Up classroom, I'll show you a picture of it. It, is, it seats 300, and, but there are tables that seat six, and they even have uh, removable whiteboards where the students can work in teams, but they can also turn and look at the professor. This is the Heiler Theater. You'll see the large windows over here. And when the theater projector comes on, the blinds automatically come down to close off the view, or to, to cut out the sunlight. The building has a lot of glass, a lot of glass. This is the boiler up classroom. You can just barely see that there are some whiteboards hanging down from the ends of the tables. And this room during the day is filled with classes. The, the faculty love teaching in it. In the evenings, you go by, and there'll be students sitting all throughout the room, more or less like an abbreviated reading room. If this were in a regular classroom building, the students wouldn't be there. When we did the surveys with our students, women especially said, we don't feel comfortable in a classroom building at night when there's no supervision. And so this building, we have guards, we have security throughout the building all night. It's 24, the entire building is 24-7. The I2I classroom is where the students can be facing each other and working together. Six round classrooms. Um, you'll see that some of the tables are fixed. Um, one of our librarians worked very hard on this to come up with the optimal number of seats and configurations so that we could meet the greatest number of needs by our students and our faculty. Because the one thing that we did, we did a trial of this in our undergraduate library. And the thing that we found out was faculty hated tables that they were too movable. Because when they would leave a class, the last professor would have had it organized one way. And by the time the next class gets in there, they have to reorganize. So the, the registrar has to find out what, is, what are the specifications or expectations of the professor 
for the class so they can know what class to put what classroom to put them in. Um, the scale up classrooms, I think once again, these are yeah, these are movable. These are movable tables. And the mobile tablet arm chairs are ones that there's another picture. The flexible classrooms where the tables can be moved and made in diff into different configurations. And then I also wanted to talk about, I was also supposed to be talking about AV and technology. Um, and I had our AV person give me a lot of the things that he wanted, that he thought other people who were in AV would want to know about. Um, the, we were very concerned about Wi-Fi saturation in the building. And so it was devised for 2.5 devices per person, per seat. Um, he now says four would have been better. I don't know where. Who would come in with four devices? But I think what it means is that the conduit, the, the ability to support that many. Um, I walk through the reading room oftentimes, and I just glance to see what students have. I never, I saw a book one day, but almost invariably it's notebooks. Um, and I'll just let you read through that. Um, they also did a um, kind of a scale up. All the classrooms do not have all of the technology installed. Our president was very concerned about putting way too much technology in the building that might not be used. And so our IT department went in and scaled up different levels of, of AV. The wiring and everything is there to be able to take it all in the future. But there was some concern that if we didn't show strong use of this technology, the president might assume that we were, that we had spent money unwisely. We do have a maker space in the building, uh, 3D. We also have an, a vision wall. Um, I gave the team in the libraries who are walk, working on how to demonstrate this very large um, uh, screen, which is six panels, nine panels. And I said, I only want to show something that becomes obvious of anybody watching this, why you need a screen this big. I do want to see just a big Excel spreadsheet. I want to see something that a person immediately knows why you have to see something this big. So they did, they worked up a very good demonstration. One of them was, they brought up a, an image, and I had the trustees all sitting there. And the image, when it first came up, looked like a beautiful flower or configuration, and then it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and you realized it was represent, representing all of the connections that the, re the scientists and the researchers had in the Cancer Research Institute. It started showing all of the connections of how they collaborate. And it did a better job of showing that interconnectivity that faculty had in their research than if we had shown a list. Because now it was, and they, they would see a name flow by, and they'd go, oh, there's so-and-so. And then they would see who he was connected to or she was connected to. It was one of the best examples. Another example was two professors. One professor in theater, dance, and another professor in computer graphics. And it showed a young woman dancing. At the same time, her image was creating uh, the image behind her that was very, very beautiful. And we couldn't have seen that if we'd been looking at a small screen. Another one was a GIS application about soil degradation in Indiana. Okay, I'm going to go through these real quick. Hmm. Wonder what happened. <laughs> oh, there's one. Um, so you can see that there are classrooms around the edges, but then in the spaces where it says open study, those are library spaces. And basically, the students really now see the building as a library. Well, second floor. The reading room is up in the is in the bottom left, the bottom center. All of the library faculty, up for science and engineering, we have 18 um, library faculty specifically for science and engineering, and they're all located. They have beautiful offices. I make the distinction. I make the decision when I'm taking tours who is on the tour. I don't take other faculty in there. Um, I don't take donors. 
because it's some of the most beautiful views in the building, looking out onto the bell tower or looking out onto the mall. Um, I, uh, I definitely don't take other faculty because they, they would be very jealous. Okay, here's the mobile uh, table chair classroom at the beginning of the day. There it is at the end of the day. And, and it really allows the professor to create an environment that um, they want to have, the students want to have. And it's a place where the students can put their bags underneath as well. Okay, that's pretty much it. Oh, the last thing. We've given a lot of tours of this building. And, uh, and we've been finding that it's getting more and more difficult to meet the demand that people have asked us to create. Um, so we're planning a forum at Purdue in uh, April of 2018. And so I'm just giving you a prelude to, prelude to this to be watching for it. Um, it'll be minimal registration, but it'll be a day and a half. And we'll, we'll have panels of students, faculty, librarians, architects to really talk about this building. Um, this, we now have a one and a half million dollar endowment for the building. Um, our goal is to get it up to five million. So that, and this is not to support the maintenance or anything, it's to support the replacement of equipment and furnishings as the building ages. Okay, I'm going to stop there and turn to questions and answers. Thank you very much. This is my swan song. I read two weeks, from, three weeks from today, I'm retired. So. <laughs>